Well, welcome to part two of Forces of Flight and Stability. In this part, we're going to take a look at lift uh, and what creates lift and how to kind of analyze it. So first, let's just refresh our memory a little bit. There are four forces on an aircraft. So there's weight, which is always attracted to the middle of Earth. Doesn't matter how you're flying. If you're flying upside down, inside out, in a loop, sideways, climbing, it always pointed towards the middle of the Earth. Then there's lift, which we're going to talk about, thrust, and drag. So what forces act on an aircraft to ensure flight? Well, of course, lift. So lift, by the technical definition, is a force that's created by the effect of airflow as it passes over and under the wing. And we've all kind of heard of lift. We all kind of know that wings generate lift. Uh, but what happens when uh, maybe lift and weight um, are equal? Well, an aircraft should be in equilibrium. It should be. It will be in equilibrium. Now, it's kind of weird to think an aircraft can be in equilibrium and still be climbing or descending. Um, it can, as long as your vertical velocity, not forward velocity, but your vertical velocity remains constant, you will be in equilibrium. So one important thing to know, though, is that as you go up or down, your gain or lose altitude, the density of air will change and so that condition will only last for so long so you'll probably need to change the attitude of your aircraft again that doesn't attitude is a special term that means configuration it doesn't mean it's giving you sass so when we talk about how lift is created the very basic thing you need to know is uh, at the top of the wing and the bottom of the wing have two different pressures. So the bottom of the wing has a higher pressure than the top of the wing. But how does that happen? We'll take a look at that in the following slides. Uh, but for now, I want you to take a look at this graphic. Um, it is an image of airfoils. And airfoil is really a two-dimensional wing. So if I stand at the tip of the wing and I look towards the fuselage, so I'm standing at the end of the wing and I'm looking towards the, the body of the aircraft. If I were to actually cut that wing um, and look at the cross section, that's called an airfoil. So an airfoil can be a lot of different shapes. And here you see a lot of different shapes. In the upper left, you see a version of the Wright Brothers airfoil. And I can't tell if that's 1906 or 1908. doesn't matter. But you can see that it's very thin. So that line that connects the front to the back has a very special name that we've talked about before. What is that name? Also, you can see that it's curved. And that curvature we can measure, and we call that camber. So there are two parts that you need to remember. The from front to back is called the cord, and the curvature is called camber. Uh, so as you look through here, you can see all kinds of different shapes. Um, down at the bottom, uh, the bottom two, you see some numbers, and you see NACA. Uh, that's not NASA. That's not a misprint. That's NACA. That stands for the National Advisory Committee. For aeronautics uh, that was established in I think 1915 to promote aeronautical research and so on it eventually did become NASA the National Aeronautics and Space Administration in 1958 so NACA was the predecessor so each one of these airfoils will give different lift even if they have the same cord so let's kind of take a little bit deeper look at that So this slide is a little bit of a review, but let's just summarize kind of what we know so far. We know that lift is created by air moving over a wing and under a wing, and it has a pressure difference that creates that lift. The pressure underneath the wing on the underside is greater than the upper part, and that's what creates the lift. So we also know that lift opposes weight. And lift can also be used not just to lift the aircraft and keep it airborne, but can also be helped to roll an aircraft. One thing I want to point out on this slide also 
is in the blue angle you see there, that's called the angle of attack. So the way we kind of calculate or look at angle of attack is if we draw a line denoting, denoting excuse me, the movement of the air, the direction of the air, and the chord, the angle between those two right here, poor drawing, I'm sorry, it's called alpha or the angle of attack. Generally, the higher or greater your angle, which is what we have here in the middle, the greater your angle of attack, the greater your lift. But that's only to a certain extent. So when we go a little bit deeper, we can look at four different, uh, four different ways to analyze and look at really what creates lift. We know it's a pressure difference, but really what creates that pressure difference? Well, there are four things that we're going to take a look at. First thing is going to be deflection. So if we look at uh, an airfoil, and you can kind of think that a good experiment to, to think about this uh, in the real world is stick your hand out the window in a moving car. And what happens? Your hand pushes down on the air um, and here you can see the blue vector pointing down to the right because that is a vector it has magnitude and direction you can break it up into two parts you can see the vertical part pointing down and the other part pointing to the right and newton's third law says for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction so because your hand is pushing down on the air um, and it's pushing forward on the air the wind is also pushing up and back on your hand, or in this case, the airfoil or the wing. But now let's get a little more sciency. You might remember from chemistry, uh, conservation of energy or physics. Conservation of energy basically says that you can neither create nor destroy energy. Uh, a good example is a roller coaster. When you're getting pulled up to that, the top of that first high hill, you are getting a lot of potential energy. You're not moving very fast, but as soon as you start going down, what happens is the total energy doesn't change much, although you lose some through friction. But there's a balance between potential energy, how high you are, and how fast you're going. So intuitively, you know, if you've been on a roller coaster that you go fastest at the bottom where you have less potential energy. And that's sort of what Bernoulli is saying here with his principle. So we apply that to aerodynamics. And if we take a look at um, a uh, tube, fluid enters a tube, and this is called a uh, Venturi tube. This kind of device is used in all kinds of fluids. And in fact, a uh, wind tunnel operates this way. So fluid enters the tube on the left, and you can see some uh, pretend gauges that the velocity is such and the, the pressure is such. What happens when it enters a smaller cross section, the air doesn't get squeezed, although in a supersonic wind tunnel it can. For right now, we're going to consider um, slow flow so we can understand the principle. What happens is the velocity increases and the pressure goes down. And then finally, when it gets to the end, it expands back again. The pressure uh, changes and the velocity changes back to its original state. So this is essentially how a wind tunnel operates. The test section of a wind tunnel is right there in the middle where it kind of gets squeezed a little bit, although I don't like to use that term. So if we look at an airfoil and apply that, so the upper section has more camber or more curvature. There's that word again. And the fluid cross section is reduced effectively. So here's kind of how I like to think of it. Um, so I have two little, two little air particles that meet at the front of that airfoil. To conserve energy, they, they have to meet on the trailing edge. But to do that, the guy on the upper airfoil has to travel farther. So because he has to travel farther in the same time, he has to go faster. 
So that creates lower pressure. So that's kind of a, an interesting way to think about it or a different way to think about it. So there's low pressure above, high pressure below, and that's what creates lift. Another way to look at it is the Coanda effect. Um, and you've probably seen this, but didn't even really know it was called that. So the Coanda effect basically says that fluid is pulled toward a solid surface. So um, probably the best way to look at it is water flowing over a spoon. So here in the left hand side, you see the spoon isn't touching the water yet, but as soon as it does touch that stream, that water is pulled to the side. That is the Coanda effect. And then here's a combined picture. So in a sense, that's also what happens on an airfoil. It gets pulled around. It goes faster, faster, higher velocity means lower pressure. Well, finally, let's take a look at circulation. So circulation, when you, if you were to take an aerospace engineering class in college, you're going to look at uh, two different cases basically. Uh, one called incompressible flow, which is the flow below Mach 3. We'll talk about Mach numbers later. So basically below 200 miles an hour. So these would be small Cessna 172s and then there's compressible flow, which is uh, a whole different set of equations. But when you consider incompressible flow, circulation becomes important. So if you look at the flow line, so if this were in a wind tunnel and you were to see um, lines of smoke, we don't have that here, but maybe I can find a video. Uh, it shows it clearly that the air curves, but because it has to meet at the back again, it has to flow faster. And we know that faster, greater velocity creates lower pressure. And thanks to PLTW and these folks for all the fine material.